Hello, extra time. Are you trying to believe not to get a hold? Because it, it damages your reputation. It, it makes people, when they read it, just laugh at you. The single club, they're playing in the league one, and they're playing in Europe, and they're their credit and the game in this country. Maybe we should get to the Premier the man is the RMC. Hello and welcome to another episode of the XPlan.com podcast. Your host Luke Jordan, the last time McDair for as long time again. McDair, how are you? I'm good, Luke. Coming up later on, we chat to Lucas Brown, Sligo Rovers, and also we chat to Connor Nestor, who is managing in the Indian Super League. So interesting story to listen to later on. But first, we will chat about the women's national team and their train of defeat to France. McDair, I won't go too much into detail about the game itself, but I suppose from a spectacle point of view, full house. Uh, again, probably a good, good send off for the team before they go out to the World Cup. But other, uh, as you recall, on Monday they've already gone out. But like it was a good send off for the players. Yeah, it was. There'd been discussion ahead of time. You know, we've all seen the other games at Tala, which were sellout and and were far from capacity. But it was seven thousand six hundred or so. So it was only a couple of hundred short of the current capacity in, in Tala Stadium. So, and um, Vera Pau was 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 pleased afterwards when when. Uh, when she was talking about it. So yeah, it was the only thing what the the goals, Ireland conceded two late goals in the first half, and it really took the um it kind of took the atmosphere out of the second half and they let in a pretty poor goal as well. But you know, when we spoke last week, Luke, I think we said that this was a real step up in opposition, and certainly I expected that France would win. They were bringing their um it was their World Cup squad, uh, it was their first uh, they hadn't played a friendly uh um Compared with with Ireland, their their last game was in April, and uh, you know they only played two games under the new manager, so they were pretty keen to to do. But I think the first forty five minutes were really good for Ireland, and um, they had a goal. Certainly looked like uh, Kira Cruz had scored; it wasn't uh, offside, but there was no no var in in Tala for for the friendly. Um, but the goals they conceded were pretty pretty poor. But I, I think they. They got what they wanted from it, and and I think we basically called that that team lineup as well, and, and as well as the shape, the five of the back, the wing backs with with Katie McCabe, and then with Nate Farrelly playing in 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 the middle, and uh, you know Heather Payne playing uh, wing back. So uh, yeah, I think they got what they wanted from, them and and no injuries. So obviously, there was the Katie McCabe went off like when she went out when she went over on her ankle, she was treated, and then she played on. She actually. She was given a couple of, presumably it was painkillers, just to to try and get through maybe to half time, And she played for about another maybe 10 or 12 minutes and then went off. But um, by all accounts, it's fine. Uh, I saw pictures, uh, sports file um, have up in the FAI have up today of them training in Brisbane. And, uh, and there she was as well. So I think that's all right. Yeah. And you mentioned one of the players we're going to hear from first, you know, a bit of audio from the match. So we're going to listen to Sinead Farry first and her thoughts on the game. I mean, I think initially we always want to defend and be close knit and tight and make sure that like France can't really get through us. But I just thought that we did like such a good job at attacking as well. And I think that maybe a lot of people don't think Ireland like they think of them as more a defensive team. But I think we showed tonight that we can do amazing things offensively, and it's just about capitalizing on that. So um, I thought the first 42 minutes, like we stuck to the game plan, it worked, and it worked really well. How was your experience of your first home game lining up for Aaron Levine in front of what was a, a record crowd for a women's international here in Ireland? Yeah, it was awesome. I was like really nervous about it, but um, really excited. And again, like the support from this entire country and the fans has just been amazing. And I think this is just like one example of that. And um, just seeing all the flags waving and you can just like feel the passion and the heart and the cheers and, and from everyone. So it's just been awesome. And were you pleased to get, you got a good run of minutes for, for today's game. You've obviously played a bit more football since we saw you last in, in the green jersey. Yeah, for sure. I've been playing more minutes with my club and I think it was 80 minutes before my calf started cramping today. So hopefully I can like push it to 90 if they need me. Um, but yeah, it was great. I think it's just like for me, just getting more experience with the team and touching a ball and really getting those anxieties out is just like helpful. Yeah. McDowell, we weren't surprised she played. She did play. And I think the general perception is that she fit in very well again to the Irish team. She played about 75 minutes and she was very good in there. Yeah. And then she, she got cramp and, and then she had to go off. Like she flicked on the header for the, the disled goal. Um, she did a few misplaced passes, but it was looking to do stuff offensively. Um, so I think you can kind of you can do that. I, I'd, I'd had a look at just um, 
you know, how many minutes she'd had, uh, you know, she played before and, um, you know, something like she'd only played like 21 minutes or something before she got called up to the the squad back in April. Um, but she's played regularly uh, with Gotham FC since then and, uh, you know, could, could go 80 minutes. Um, and yeah, I, I think, I think she'll, she'll start again. I, I don't think, she didn't play her way out of the starting eleven for the uh, for the Australia game, anyway. In terms of the team itself, would you be happy with that eleven playing against Australia in two weeks' time? Well, nearly not in two days. What's it? Less than two weeks now. It's Thursday week. So, in what? Where do you see the team now? Because like France is a good barometer for to go off similar stand to Australia. Do you think is there a tweak they should make in terms of formation or? Yeah. Well, they playing, all playing all or whatever. Yeah, Bo Verapau and and all three players that we spoke to after week, which were all Irish Americans, which I thought was amusing in the the week of of July fourth. Um, uh, they all talked about how good the first forty five minutes were, and and they were, but they weren't great now in the second half, and and it, the goals that they gave away weren't great. They gave away goals from set piece, didn't pick up players. France looked to kind of exploit. Megan Connolly was in. Uh, in the back three and they kind of look to exploit her so whether maybe you know it's not her natural position I think she would probably be better playing uh, in front of the back four like Ireland played I thought it was kind of like a box four midfield uh, where they'd um, they'd little John and and Denise Sullivan was was a lot deeper than she normally would but I think maybe you might push Connolly up into midfield, maybe Diane Caldwell might come in at at, at centre half, or maybe Clara Reardon might come in at centre half to the three centre halves. But it, it'll be uh Quinn in the middle and and Fahi out wide. Like they're they're the more experienced players, as in the the older players in the def- in defensively. And uh they um, you know, maybe we might need a little bit of of extra pace, maybe uh, in the centre. So that might be that might be the one change. Um, like Marissa Shiva played as well, and I thought she, thought she was, I thought she was good. Um, I did speak to her after. So we might listen to that audio in a little bit. But one of the things I think she, I had asked both um, Farrelly and Shiva was just about playing in front of of a big crowd. So it was like seven thousand six hundred. I asked Shiva like, what was the biggest crowd she played in front of? And she said it was like I think maybe twenty twenty five thousand. So, you know, how how are you going to deal with 80,000? So she said she's been talking with her sports psychologist and uh, doing visualization, just thinking about it, which I thought was an interesting way of doing it. Whereas I can't remember whether I mentioned it last week, but Chloe Mustaki in the Gothenburg game in qualifiers, she talked about not looking up at the crowd at all. She just concentrated on the pitch, um, which, is, which is maybe a different way of doing it. Um, so like, and, and it's it's a bit of a whirlwind for both Farley and Shiva because that was the first time they played a, a home game um and uh so i think that that was uh you know not a particularly big crowd compared to what they're what they're going to go to but i think they were they were both kind of trying to talk through well what it was 20,000 is 20,000 you know when it's four times that will it feel like it's four times that so um we'll have to just uh we'll have to just wait and see but i think she she put enough in she's quite lively uh, did a lot of pressing. Vera Pau spoke afterwards about both of them, and and she said that um, Shiva was an engine, is how she described her, very good on the ball, not giving the ball away. And then she describes Farley as being a bit more subtle, um, which was which was a nice nice description. But I think they, you know, there are two players who looked they were they were uh, getting their passports ahead of Ireland qualifying, uh, rather than maybe you know there was others who were looking to come on board afterwards, and I think. They're probably the two additions that you could say, yeah, Ireland, Ireland are better with those two players, certainly in the squad and, and probably in the starting lineup. That they'll just add maybe that extra bit of quality ahead of maybe what we what we have when we're coming up against these really big teams, the likes of Australia, um, Canada, who are Olympic champions, and Nigeria, who potentially are falling apart, uh, looking for bonuses and things behind the, behind the scenes. So um, that might be. Uh, that might be helpful to us yeah there was a report that was published we obviously don't know the the ins and outs but if that game is called off and I'm over there I, I will be annoyed but I mean, that, that's As no, they'll, 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 <laughs> a, a deal will be done that match will go ahead but it'll be just very very disruptive for uh, for the, the team ahead of that 
Do you want to maybe? Nice. Do you want to maybe listen to? We might play that Mercy Shiva audio now. Do you know what? We'll play it right now. Yeah, I had chills. I mean, the girls warned me that the fans were going to be incredible, the pitch was going to be incredible, and just, you know, the atmosphere is unlike anything else. Um, and they weren't wrong, and honestly, it was it was more than I expected. Um, you know, like, after we conceded, the, the fans got behind us even more. You could hear the crowd just really trying to get behind us. And so, in some ways, um, disappointed, obviously, we would have loved to get a positive result heading down to Australia, but... Um, you know, I, we, we feel the support from the fans, and I think there's a lot that we can take from the game, to, um, positives and negatives, that will help us leading into the tournament. And your own contribution, you were pretty lively during the game. You caused France a lot of difficulty, looked into force errors. You really, you really pressed France. How did you think you performed? Yeah, I think, I mean, similar to the t- like the collective, um, I think there were things I did well, and I think that there are things that I need to sharpen up. Um, um, overall, I think that the team is starting to get um, more comfortable playing with each other. There's a few new pieces within the group, so I think that um, I'm starting to get more comfortable playing with Katie and Kira and Rusha, kind of that little group um, on the left side of the field, and um, Megan. So I think that's starting to get more comfortable, and we're starting to be able to combine a little bit more, which um, you know always feels good. And I think we saw parts of that in the first 45 minutes. Um, so excited! It's a, I'm excited to continue to sharpen up with them, and um, yeah, hopefully be even better against Australia. Like the last couple of weeks, you've been able to work together with the team since you've come in. A bit longer for some of the others who've been in the camp, but uh, the game might have been almost a bit of a relief to play a, a football match rather than training and working on things this evening. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, no, the girls have been in camp and they have been working their butts off for quite some time now. And um, those of us that play in the NWSL are in the middle of the season, so we came over a bit later. But um, yeah, no, I think that there's, I mean, you, it's tough to replicate 11 v 11 all the time, and um, especially against, uh, you know, a, a top team in the world like France. So, I mean, this is, I think Vera said it, this is how you get better. You, you don't play weak opponents to get confidence or to get better. You have to play the top teams in the world because, I mean, we're, we're in a tough group, objectively, um, and to prepare, we have to play against teams like France, and I think if that 45 minutes, the first 45 minutes showed anything, it's that we, t- we can absolutely compete with the top teams in the world, and um, I would argue that we are one of them when we're at our best, um, and I think we showed that tonight, and I think we've shown that um, in our past few camps, uh, including the games against the United States. Vera. How was she after the match back there? I know we won't go into, we spoke about last week, we're going to move on from that, but just a general mood. Yeah, uh, no, she... she to watch the Irish media? Yeah, no, we, so the way the media was set up in, in Tala, in, in people will know the, the the shop unit, that's now the the media centre, and, and there was pockets for the written press, the digital media, so myself, um, Anthony Pine was there for RT online, Emma Duffy for 42, Um Irish fan TV, uh, WNL show. So, so we were together. So we're with the written press, uh, off the ball. And RT also spoke separately uh, to them as well. So we were last. So she came to us last, and there was a bit of a guys. If we could be from the media officer, if we could be quick here, that'd be great because we we want to head away. They were flying mm-hmm. out. I think she flew out on the Friday. They they went in two batches. I think FIFA paid for the the flights out. The business class. We couldn't get everyone on the business class flights out. So. Um, so, but she, she spoke and answered all our questions. We probably talked to her for about maybe 15 minutes, um, you know, coming up towards 11 o'clock. So, um, I think she was, uh, she didn't seem overly worried about Katie McCabe. It was like, listen, I can't really tell. We'll know in the morning. So that was probably the only kind of downer on that. She was very happy with how the team had played. Um, she spoke a bit about, um, you know, just the setup in the camp that they were, that, that they were doing, uh, ahead of ahead of the matches um and, and then talked about you know we took this match because you know i don't mind they're making mistakes in this match because it'll get us uh you, you know we make mistakes in this match we won't make them in the next game so you you hope that's the case um there wasn't really there wasn't a question put to her in relation to the the stuff about um you, you know that was written in the athletic in the NW cell. I did hear her on on second captains and and when she talked to the written press as well, it was kind of put to her and uh, you know she spoke about listen want to put it behind. There's been enough about about me. It's now about the team, and 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 
that after the World Cup, she'll answer any and all questions. And I think, as I said last week, I think that was, I, I kind of expected that would be the case. She answered all the questions the day before, went through it. And, and if there was nothing else to be that had come out, there's no point in asking these questions questions again. Um, so so I think uh, f- from from that point of view, it's it's full focus now uh, on training, preparing for the Columbia Games. So the, the first training session on on Thursday in in Brisbane looked nice and sunny out there, and uh, they're gearing up for this this Columbia game where they'll be able to maximise the number of substitutes, which is why it isn't a full international. And they're going to mix up the squad, aren't they, for that game? It's going to be a different level. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, and that that's the case. It, it'll it'll be a lot about managing minutes for the players as well. Um, and 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 that'll be uh, that's the case. It's it's not. Um, uh, it's not a I say it's not a, a proper international, so there won't be caps given out for 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 that one. Okay. In terms of a the tournament, then are you looking forward to it? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I'm a bit apprehensive just about how how we do, but I, 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 the the team has confounded my predictions in the past before. I, like I didn't think that didn't think they'd get a result out in in Sweden and they did and, and that was really really crucial for for qualification the, the point in, in Gothenburg and um, and I, I feared for them in Scotland just for uh the turnaround of being an away match um Scotland were ranked higher not that I'd know too much about um you know the Scottish women's national team um but uh so so maybe I, I, I'm I'm keeping that opinion going so that that uh, they'll pleasantly surprised me I, I think the, their best case scenario was probably maybe to get a draw in that first game that they could maybe catch um, catch Australia maybe cold at the start of the tournament just the pressure of the tournament it'll be the opening game now I I, I don't know for the, the men's World Cup uh, last year every game had its own opening ceremony um, uh, which is great when you're there uh, I'm going to complain here when you go to so many matches and you see the same ceremony each time. But anyway, uh, it's the same songs, it's the same DJ. But but there's there's a bit of a there's a bit of a build up. There might be something slightly different with this one. It's not the opening game of the tournament. It is on the opening day of the game. But the opening ceremony of the whole tournament uh, will be in in New Zealand. But there'll be a bit of hype around it, and and maybe hopefully the Ireland team can kind of blinker that out. Uh, as I say Canada ranks very highly as well, and you know if we're to if we're to get through, um, you know, you're then maybe relying on on getting a win in the in the final game in Brisbane against uh, against Nigeria. But no, I am really looking forward to. It. You're, you're looking at the the videos that are are doing the the rounds. Or did a really good one ahead of the uh, ahead of the France game, just just building up towards it. Um, and and there'll be more like this 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 full there'll be full coverage like right across. RT but on radio and on television and um you know just chatting to a few of the I was very envious of uh, chatting to a few of the the journalists on on Thursday who were all flying out um it'll be busy hard work for the, for them I, I, I be be sure but there's a big number of crew going out to cover it and, and rightly so so I think we'll get the we'll get the full story of of just how the 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 tournament goes um but yeah and no, I'm really looking forward to it and just looking forward to the games are kind of different times of the day. So getting up and watching maybe games over breakfast and uh, um, taking early lunches and, and maybe uh, to, to watch some of the other games outside of Ireland as well. So the dates are as follows, as you mentioned on the previous podcast, the big game, really, the 80,000 game, Australia, Ireland, the kickoff for the host nation. That's Thursday, the July 20th, 11 a.m. Irish time. Then on Wednesday, July 26th, Canada v. Ireland. That's in Perth. That is a 1 p.m. kickoff Irish time. And then finally, then Monday, July 31st, in Brisbane against Nigeria. And that is at 11 a.m. Irish time. I, if we look at the games there, look, they are going to be tough games, no doubt about it. And we are probably the underdog going in. It's our first tournament, so we've no pressure, to be honest. Four points should be the the, the objective, I would say. And if you, give, if you get four points, it gives you a platform possible to get out of the group. And that's a good tournament. Yeah, yeah, no, you 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 can afford to kind of lose a game, but yeah, I think four points, four points should be, I think, is a realistic aim. Um, but I think it'll be, yeah, I think it'll be difficult. Well, and look to be fair, this Irish team since Vera's come in, and especially the last two years, we're a hard enough to crack. I know France put three bias, but look, that happens in most games. It, it, there's only a goal in it, really, when we play like when we play in Sweden, Finland, these top nations in Europe. It's only been a goal in it, two ones, one nils. So there's no reason to why we can't go to tournament and why not get four points? 
Yeah, and we have beaten. We did beat Australia three two in in Tata Stadium, um, which was the kind of the win that was the platform we kind of built from in the qualifying then for for the World Cup. Yep, and I've also played on FIFA the World Cup mode, and I got to the final. And I lost four three to the United States. So look, I'll be the optimist. We we might get to the final. You never well, know. I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that. Well, four three. I rather, I rather win. I rather not Trinity Robin score a hat against Ireland. To be honest, but hey. Um, Look, I look forward to the game. Do you know what we'll do? We'll move on and we have an interview with Lucas Browning and we have Connor Nesta coming up, so stay tuned. Get in touch. You can email us at extratimelive at gmail.com or tag us on Instagram using the hashtag League of Ireland or tweet us at Extra Time News. Let's do it. Welcome back to the second half. Don Ryan is joining me now and we're delighted to welcome our Sliger Arts midfield player, Lucas Browning. Lucas, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, I'm good. I suppose the first place to start was the, which you mentioned there before you start recording. Uh, there was a tough one on Friday night to take against Derry. Yeah, tough one to take, and uh, we were disappointed not to come away with any points. Uh, but unfortunately, that's the way it is, and we have to regroup and uh, move on. Is it frustrating this year for yourself and the group that you posted a great performance in against, say, Derry? There, top of the league, chasing obviously the league title against Town Growers. And you, you throw in the forms like you used to be. Is it as a group? Are you just like we have to get that consistency right now going forward? Absolutely, it's uh, frustrating and uh, it's uh, what we need to work on because uh, good teams can have moments. And uh, if we want to become a great team and a team that uh, is uh, challenging, we need to keep uh, consistent and uh, yeah, week in week out, produce uh, what we know we can produce. Where do you think that kind of inconsistency is coming from? I mean, people have seen what Sligo Rovers are capable of. I mean, some of the football at times this year has been absolutely fantastic. But then, <clears> as we mentioned there, the performance against UCD and stuff like that, and then getting so close against Derry City. Like, where does the inconsistency come from, do you think? I, if, if I knew the answer, it would be great. But I think it's uh, I think it's a combination of different things. Obviously, when a few results uh, go against you uh, a couple of weeks in a row, then... Uh, the mental game is a big part, so uh, some doubt can creep in. And uh, whenever a player has doubt, you can see it. Uh, Decision making, uh, confidence, all this kind of stuff. So that always plays a part. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure. We need to we need to uh, work on those things. Those things, and that's what we're doing every week to try and get consistent, to try and put in these perform performances. But uh, the positive thing positive thing is that we have them it would be worse if we didn't have them so so we know what we're capable of and one thing that's really been hampering Sligo Rover so far this season is just the amount of injuries plain and simple like as a Sligo Rovers fan I can never remember a season that's been as bad for injuries for the longest time absolutely yeah we've uh, struggled with injuries uh, which is a part of the game uh, in uh, in some cases injuries are uh, preventable but in some cases they're not so unfortunately we have had uh, a lot of injuries but uh, uh, we, we have other players who need to step up and, and uh, we have people from the academy coming up but yeah of course the injuries has uh, been a big issue for us and how have you found the season yourself like from a personal point of view have you enjoyed playing in the League of Ireland or have you been happy with your own performances or what do you think yourself uh, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Obviously, results are results, uh, but uh, I've enjoyed it. It's a different type of uh, football to what I'm used to. A lot, a lot more physical, higher tempo, a lot of uh, goal chances. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, when the team is not performing, uh, it can show on uh, the players' individual performances. So uh, I've played a lot of games, but uh, I think there's still a lot to come from me. How did the move to the, the West Coast of Ireland come about, Lucas? I got in contact with uh, John Russell uh, and uh, he presented uh, uh, the plan and uh, the club, Sligo, and uh, and uh, we we uh, had a conversation and I was really intrigued and, and uh, I was excited uh, because John is a, is a manager that is uh, working very hard and is very uh, disciplined, organised and uh, very clear in what he wants so that's how it came about and then I just decided that this is the place for me 
you, you mentioned there in your previous answer the Donald's questions in terms of the physicality. Is that one of probably the, the big difference, maybe say between the the Swedish football and maybe playing Irish football, that there is maybe a bit more physicality. It's maybe I suppose it, the league is getting more technical party than it was five years ago, is maybe a, it's still a bit behind in terms of maybe say Swedish leagues or Scandinavian leagues. Uh, yeah, I mean, physicality can be different things, but in this case, uh, I'm talking a lot about the jewels, uh, second balls, aerial jewels. Uh, for sure, that's more, uh, I come across a lot of those situations here, not as much as I would in Sweden, but in Sweden, you need to be able to run a lot. And uh, in Sweden, uh, you have a lot of artificial games where the ball travels quickly, so you can't really get close to people. Whereas here, we're playing on grass. The ball, the ball is slow. Pitches might be slow. Uh, the bounces might might be uh, be uh, uh, the pitch might be bouncy, and these things all contribute to that. So, so in terms of that, yeah, the the league is very physical. It's interesting here about the your the point the artificial pitches because I suppose a lot of chat around the league between the fan pundits journalists that a lot of them give out about say Derry and Dundalk which you played in that the the artificial pitches whatever they're they're not they're not the same as grass like what what's your own point of view do, you, do would you prefer to play in a grass pitch or like are you just so accustomed there to playing on Astro or artificial pitches with just growing up in Sweden Scandinavia? Uh, yeah I'm growing up on artificial so I have no problem with artificial the problem is that uh, uh, there's bad artificial and, and good obviously mm. and uh if it's a bad artificial, uh, the the game is totally different. Uh, but I prefer grass. Uh, but I have no problem with artificial. But the likes of Derry and, and Dundalk, they're not the best. Uh, whereas in Sweden, you would have artificial, but you would barely feel a difference because it's so soft and they change it every five, six years. So I think that's... If you want to have artificial in the league, you need to, to maintain them and... and uh, and keep them fresh because otherwise uh, the game becomes different and also the, the risk of uh, injury and wear and tear on all the players is, is higher. Just um, move it, moving to Ireland and coming over here, how do you, how do you settled in? Because some of players coming over, say, different countries, like settling well, homesick kicks in. How have you found yourself moving over from Sweden over to Ireland? Uh, no, I've uh, found it very easy to settle in because uh, we have a good group here uh, and the town is uh, very welcoming and the people in the club. So that's been no issue. And I obviously have my uh, my uh, fair share of experience from, from abroad already since a young age. So that has never really been an issue, but uh, uh, it doesn't come by itself. People have helped and people have uh, organized for us players coming in from abroad. So... It's been really easy to settle in. Easy to come back to Ireland, Lucas. I can imagine, as you can imagine, given that you were born in Drada, so there is a bit of a connection there already. Absolutely, yeah. So born in Drada, moved early to Sweden, and uh, my father is Irish. So, yeah, it was not a totally a new country for me. And it was really not there earlier on. You do, you do uh, have a couple of games for Ireland at underage level. Would I be right in saying that? And um, it, it could have been so different. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it could have. I played uh, under 15 and uh, under uh, 17 uh, for Ireland. But uh, I also played some games for Sweden. Uh, so I, I uh, played with both. But I imagine that Sweden was always your, your number one priority, I suppose. Yeah, it's, it's always difficult. Like... Uh, when you have roots in another country, uh, when you're in Sweden, you're you're not really Swedish, and when you're here, you're you're not really Irish. So it's it's difficult. But uh, since I've spent a lot of time in in Sweden, it it comes more naturally to me, I guess. How does the approach come? So if you're grown up in in Sweden, how does the approach come from the FEI team? Like how do they know about your eligibility, say to play for Ireland? Like did you was there a contact someone in Ireland that told you in touch, or how like how did it come through? Uh, the first time was under 15. At that time, I was uh, playing for uh, St. Kevin's for, for six months. So that's how, how they uh, reached out to me then. And then, obviously, they keep track since then, I believe. And and under 17, they saw me play. 
for Sweden in a tournament. Uh, so that's the way they get in touch, I think. That's interesting that you, you play for St. Kevin's Boys where you were obviously living in Dublin for a while, were you? Uh, I was living in uh, Drogheda, so commute to Dublin. Okay. And was there any players in the Irish setup or at like Kevin's you were playing with that say have gone to play at the League of Ireland or abroad or is there any players you're playing with? Yeah, in Kevin's there, there was a uh, uh, Daryl O'Shea was playing for Kevin's uh, and then the Ireland squad was uh, players like uh, Jason Malumby, uh Tyreek Wilson is playing for, for Shelbourne uh, Declan Rice was there a, a while also uh, so a lot of good players now. yeah, a lot of good players Declan Rice, what did you make of him? Yeah, he was he was a good Good back then as well, but he was playing uh, uh, defender then, uh, and obviously now he's moved up to midfield. But yeah, you could see he's a strong guy, physical guy, good on the ball. So he was very good then also. You were keeping him out at the middle of the park, so Lucas, were right? <laughs> Sometimes, not, not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny, like I can no, I'm just guessing, but like reading people about him, obviously he grew up kind of as a centre back uh, as a player. Would you have expected the the progression he made in his career to become, say, a nearly hundred million pound player going to Arsenal? Would, would, or was there someone say someone else maybe might have thought he's I thought he'd go make third? Like how does that come at that age? What do you think? No, that's I think that's very difficult to see. But you can obviously see uh, players with quality, but so much happens from fifteen to twenty. So you could never uh, pick out uh, who would become that. 100 million player uh, but uh, you can see who has quality and obviously there's a mental side to the game and physical side and injuries and a lot of factors so that it's difficult but yeah you can see the quality in, in some players I think What's it like for like obviously you've obviously been born in Sweden so it's like, it's like a foreign player coming into play for a different national team What's that? What's that experience like? Because we were talking to a player last week, like Kerry Dale Gaska, who who's Albanian parents, is born here. He played on the race down for Albania, so he felt like it was, it was a bit of a culture shock going to a different dressing room, different language, whatever. How did you find coming as a, as a Swedish guy going into an Irish dressing room? What was that like for you? Yeah, uh, I would agree with what uh, uh, what you said there, and that's what happened to me as well because. When you grow up in, in in a Swedish environment and and then you obviously come here, it's different the way people act, the way they talk. Uh, obviously, football is also a different environment. So so I agree with that, and that I kind of uh, realized then as soon as I came here and played for Ireland a few times that yeah, I'm pretty Swedish in my ways, you know. But but that that was the way I, I saw it then, and I realized there. Uh, but uh, for sure, it's 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 difficult. You know, you become this Swedish guy in the Irish setup. It's it's hard. You know. What well, um in terms of your time out there, like you realize you're Swedish. What was the big differences for you that you noticed, say playing say in Sweden and coming out play for Ireland in Irish dress? What was the big differences? Uh, I think on the pitch, uh, the way we played when when I played for Ireland was a lot of uh, aggression, high tempo, and uh, yeah, used a lot of of willpower and we were together as a group uh, but uh, in Sweden whereas we were more uh, defending uh, low blocks and, and uh, everyone was working for the team it's, it's different environments and also outside of football uh, it was kind of hard sometimes to uh, to keep up with the, with the with the jokes and uh, talking and uh, yeah, I struggle sometimes with that. So you don't really connect with the group sometimes. What you're trying to say is we're talking too fast per usual. <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, you you pretty much said that. I understand. Okay, no, um, no, it's interesting to get that perspective. Um, just reading about you as well. Like you had a a spell in Holland. That must have been a, a culture shock as well. Going to play for FC Twenty Academy again, one of the top teams in. In the art of easy, that must have been a great experience for you to, for for any of a football kind of education. Absolutely, yeah, great experience and uh, a country that was uh, quite similar to Sweden, more so than Ireland, uh, which I really enjoyed and and a lot of good players, a lot of uh, a, a lot of quality, uh, 
but also high tempo, a lot of running. You need to be able to defend one against one. Uh, so I learned a lot. Obviously, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, make a statement there and, and move on to something bigger. I had to take a step back, but but I'm for forever grateful for the experience and uh, uh, people that you meet along the way. You know, I can imagine. This is only me guessing, but like I would say that being in a, a Dutch academy be much more progressive in terms of maybe how they play compared to say Sweden and Ireland. You mentioned kind of the low blocks. Is it is it a case of when you're playing versus twenty, it's on the front foot, being aggressive and you're kind of play attacking rather than sitting back and defending? Like is, is I suppose that's probably a, a good thing for you to experience both that you're you're learning from both sides of the game. Absolutely, uh, and uh, you're also playing against players who are better than you uh stronger faster and the the the, the quality just it's from all, all around the world so so the the level in training and games is is always going to be higher and that's always going to make you improve uh that was a major thing you remember you're a professional debut in football uh in a professional i believe it was in uh, when i came back to sweden after holland that was my first first uh, professional uh, at senior level. I believe I was just turned 20 or something. And in terms of playing the, was it the Swedish top flight or was it the second division? No, second division. And in terms of, say, like comparing the facilities, say, to the League of Ireland, to say even the, the Swedish second flight, what's the comparison like, say, going around to say even a, a level of the grounds, for example? Like, what are the, say, the grounds like in the Swedish second division compared to Ireland. Yeah, most of the grounds are are uh, a lot more uh, modern, and uh, dressing rooms are uh, better. Uh, here in the League of Ireland, there's uh, a lot of stadiums who, uh, which are quite run down uh, that that need to be renewed. I, I think uh, I think uh, the standard. In Sweden, is more so what Sham uh, Shamrock Rovers have in uh, Tala. That would be the n- normal stadium in Sweden. Lucas, were you surprised at the standard of like the facilities and the stadiums in Ireland when you came over? Like, were they what you were expecting? Like, were you expecting a little bit more, or were you kind of familiar with it already? No, I was quite fam- familiar with it, but uh, the thing is with the grounds here that. Some of them are small, and when obviously this year that the 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 numbers, uh, the number of people who come to the games, it makes the game so so good and so nice to play because the stadiums are quite compact and small, and then it feels like there's a lot of people and people are making noise. So that would be that would be much better here than in Sweden because in Sweden in the second division you would have a stadium that could take ten thousand people. And then there's 2,000 people there. So it feels empty, but there's 2,000 people, you know? Yeah, and uh, obviously things aren't going too well for Cycle Rovers on the pitch at the minute, but off the pitch, obviously, with the development of the stadium that'll be happening over the next couple of years, it's pr- it must be a pretty exciting time to be involved within the club. Absolutely. That's going to be a massive boost for, for, for the club and also for the town. Uh, but this year already, the fans have come out in big numbers every every home game and they also travel to the away games uh, which is great and it it's just it's just so nice to play uh, those games and when you get the crowd behind you it's it's uh, it's great and you mentioned Shamrock Rovers there earlier on obviously your first game in the league of ireland was against them the first game of the season and a pretty pretty magic moment from yourself right at the death there to put yourself on the score sheet and earn a point Absolutely. Uh, that was a great moment and uh, that kicked us off uh, well in the season, but uh, the team uh, was obviously going into that game to win the game, but we settled for the point there also. And the crowd that night as well, the showgrounds obviously was the first game back at, uh, at the start of the season. It was a huge crowd in there. I think it was well over 3,000, I believe, was the official attendance. Like how much, you, you touched on as well, the, how important the support is especially in terms of traveling to away games and stuff, but like it must be such a really important factor for players to feed off that, especially in kind of close tight knit grounds like the showgrounds. Absolutely, 
absolutely it's it's amazing for the team and it gives those extra extra that extra uh, kick for the team and whenever the team is uh, either playing well or struggling or whatever the scenario is in the game the crowd always gives gives to the team and that that's uh, that's amazing for us to have that support Luke, with the European games coming up, I suppose, you mentioned Shamrock Rovers there and you played against them a couple of times this year and obviously they become the top side in the league. Where do you think they stand now like with the standard league, say, in the couple of top teams at the moment? Where do you think they compare with, say, maybe the top teams in Sweden, for example? Are they on a similar level or is there still a bit to go to catch maybe the top teams in Sweden? What do you think? Difficult to say, but... Uh, last season we saw you Gordon against Shamrock Rovers in the in the in Europe, which was uh, the first game Shamrock uh, played very well, and I think they matched up very very well with you Gordon. But in the second game, you can see that that there's a there's a next level to you Gordon. Obviously, you Gordon last season were performing very well, but there is a there is a difference difference I believe uh, for sure, and. Uh, I, how to get there, I'm not sure, but but uh, some changes need to be made either to progress and, and either catch up with the teams or go beyond, you know. Obviously, Lucas Sligo Rovers would have went on a, a European run there just the year before you signed. Would European football have been a big draw to you to come to Ireland? Like, obviously, when you see the teams that are going well, they seem to, Irish teams seem to be doing better year on year in European competition. Was that more of a draw to bring you into the League of Ireland? That was a, a big factor for me. Uh, obviously, when, when John contacted me, that was uh, right before the Motherwell game. Uh, so I sat down and watched that and that was amazing uh, to get so so uh, far in there uh, in Europe. Uh, obviously, the game at home was a, was a great game to watch and, and that's what you want as a team, as a club. You need to you want to reach uh, Europe. You want to reach group stages, uh, and that's uh, that's the aim for 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 all the the clubs, I suppose. But but yeah, it's uh, it's massive Europe, isn't it? And finally, Lucas. Um, obviously, Cork City come to the showgrounds this weekend, but then in the weeks after, there's a cup game against your your hometown club, Drogheda. Like they're away to Rovers, Rovers are away to them then again in the league do you look forward to those kind of games like given obviously you wouldn't have spent too much time in Drogheda but you were born there like do you look forward to those kind of games I do yeah uh, obviously the the first game is always special against uh, the first game was special against Drogheda but uh, I think now it's more of a just a team as as uh, all, all the teams but yeah I look forward to all the games to be fair you have a score prediction for Saturday night Lucas Against Cork, oh, I wouldn't dare to, to say a score, but but uh, yeah, I hope uh, Sligo Sligo is going to take the three points. Lucas, great your time. Thanks for coming on. We'll chat again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Extratime.ie. Get in touch through Facebook or tweet us at Extra Time News. League of Ireland football is our passion. Welcome back to the third half. Now delighted to welcome on Connor Nestor. Connor, how are you? I'm good, Luke. I uh, thought you've had a fairly busy week this week. Yeah, I just uh, flew in. I think I, I landed in Dublin Airport seven thirty Sunday morning, and then straight into the second part of our pro license here. And uh, we'll 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 fly out unfortunately as soon as it's done, just because I have got a busy schedule. So don't get to enjoy home too much other other than the course itself. Yeah, and that piece of schedule, I suppose, was it last week the news broke that you're a point of manager of a, of, I suppose, a club many not, might not hear about in Ireland if you want to elaborate. Yeah, I, I've just moved to a club called Hyderabad FC, which is is one of the 12 teams in the Indian Super League. Um, so um, I actually moved out there six, seven weeks ago, but the announcement was there last week. Um, so yeah, it's a new opportunity for me, having been working in Cambodia for the last five and a half years. Yeah, I, I, I suppose we were just you were just chatting briefly before we were recording that the journey I suppose you've made, it's not a common one you'd see from Irish coaches abroad, I suppose, like just maybe bringing it back to your, your roots, like whereabouts you grow up around? Yeah, so I'm from Fines in West Limerick. Um, 
And I suppose, you know, like most most kids was in love with football from very young. I was an OK youth footballer. Um, could see that I wasn't going to be a professional footballer and got into coaching quite young. Um, spent some time in the US coaching. And then when development officer role started coming up in the FAI, I, I applied uh, for one in Limerick and, and got the job. And I developed a lot. I was almost 10 years with the FAI. Developed a lot as a coach and a tutor and, and, and in lots of different ways. Uh, was lucky that I, I, I did some work with Limerick FC, with Tommy Barrett. I was Tommy Barrett's assistant with Limerick um, when he was at the under-19s. Uh, but yeah, about 2016, I just, you know, I wanted to be a full time coach and I just felt the opportunities in Ireland were limited. So I decided that, that meant me leaving the country, basically. Um, and I wasn't too concerned where I ended up once I was able to get to work with players every day, basically. And uh, where I ended up was was Cambodia initially and, and India now. And uh, I've been lucky in that, you know, I've been a head coach for about 150 games in Cambodia. and I. You know, I don't think I was getting that that opportunity in Ireland if I stayed. In terms of the, you mentioned the, the MLS clubs there, like so, what clubs were in particular were you looking at when you're over in the United States? Oh, uh, yeah. So when, well, there's two trips to the states. So I worked as a coach, just coach coaching kind of grassroots level when I first went there. And then after I left FAI in 2016, I, w- I went more on a kind of study visit to the U.S. So I would have visited New York City FC, uh, Colorado Rapids. Um, Park Smith is obviously the sporting director there in Colorado Rapids. I uh, went to Louisville um, where James O'Connor was the coach at the time, but uh, now, now he's the sporting director. So I went all over the place really, just try tried to get into a kind of different environment, if you like, to what we have in Ireland to, to learn from it. And uh, I actually ended up in Melbourne. A friend of mine said, will you come out and run a, a coaching academy for me? Um, and how I ended up in Cambodia was basically I was waiting for, I, st- I lived in Melbourne for six months. Then I was getting a two-year sponsorship in, in, in Melbourne and I had to kind of leave the country while I was waiting for the visa. I just laid my hat in Cambodia for a little while. Uh, did some part-time coaching with a semi-pro team. Uh, that semi-pro team got a couple of results, and then one of the, one of the top pro teams basically asked me to stay. So, uh, you know, I'd say my journey has been half deliberate in terms of making the decision to leave Ireland, and then half accident in terms of where you just happen to be in a country where where the right opportunity comes. Yeah, so it was, so I imagine it was a bit of a whirlwind that for one moment you thought your your life was heading towards say Australia, and the next thing you're you're staying in Cambodia. Yeah, it was a funny one because I think if I'm being honest, the, the decision to stay in in Melbourne was more about lifestyle and more about like you know I I had a um some kind of long term friends that had moved out to Melbourne, so I was like, you know what, this this is a great place to kind of move and settle down, but. The decisions weren't footballing based, you know. So when when I suppose I had that decision of, well, do you want to be a head coach or do you want to go to that city that you like living in? Uh, it was look it was about six seconds I took and I decided to be a head coach, you know, because it's obviously at that stage I'd put about 15, 16 years in into developing as a coach. So I suppose it's one of those where you just you want to find out if you can compete at a professional level or not. Yeah, and just to bring it back, I suppose, before we chat about the Cambodia, the Cambodia, uh, your time, sorry, your time in Cambodia, rather, just in terms of with the FBI and being a developmental officer, what was kind of your, your main issue? Was just the fact that was it the work life balance or was it just, uh, again, during the time, I suppose, was, this would have been probably around 2010 or 2015. I, I imagine it was probably a very difficult time to work for the FBI with a lot of issues off the field in terms of finance and all. I suppose that probably was factors in your, in your, reason for leaving um i'd say probably no to be honest though it definitely wasn't financial because from my perspective um i was this you know young re- relatively young person in love with football in love with coaching uh working for my national association in the parts of the country i came from so i for the years um, because I was passionate about the work that we were doing there but um, ultimately I, I felt like if I did work there for 60 years I wasn't making as big a difference as I'd like to make um, 
just because the job is so multifaceted and you're so serv- I was servicing over 70 football clubs, over 120 primary schools, over 20 secondary schools, multiple leagues. Uh, when you look at elite teams between boys and girls, I had more than 13 to try and kind of facilitate. And, you know, when you have that much quantity, you can't really do that much quality. And, and that was my issue. And in, instead of trying to make a small difference in a lot of people's lives, I decided that I want to work with a small amount of people and try and make as big a difference in their lives as possible, basically. Um, so that, that was probably what made the mind up uh, more than the financial side, because, uh, you know, when you decide really you're going to become a football coach, uh, or work in football, the financial reward is only at the very, very top end. You know, um, it's, it's, it's not that great unless you get to the very top end. So it's, it's more about the passion, I'd say, than the money, you know. Yeah, uh, what was the club then you, you ended up taking over in Cambodia? Yeah, so their full title is Pre Can Reek Swirian FC. So uh, uh, you'll be happy to know that most people just call them Swirian. Um, so yeah, so I I I, I moved there. Um, it was I think February 2018 uh, when I took on the mantle there, and um, yeah, five full five full seasons and heading into my sixth season. Uh, when when this opportunity came up to move to India, so so um, really enjoyed my time in Cambodia. Was very lucky that the the club owner, the CEO, the GM, basically gave me full full reign and 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 full control. And I think to go into a job like that uh, as a thirty three year old coach and kind of yeah be given so much authority was was a great learning experience. Yeah, and. I'd love to hear about just those kind of first initial weeks. Like the they they'd have completely no idea who you are. This I suppose thirty three young Irish manager coming in. What was from your own perspective? What were the, the kind of the major difficulties? Was it the language barrier, or was it just maybe culturally different when it comes to football? Like what what, what kind of difficulties did you come across in the first couple of weeks? Um. Yeah. So the language barrier. I just. There was there was a friend of mine that I'd met already at this stage in Cambodia in my couple of months there called Connor Wall from from Cork, um, who'd lived in Cambodia for 15, 16 years, spoke the Khmer, the Cambodian language fluently, was a, a massive sports fan, a really good person. And he was my first sign in because, uh, you know, I wanted someone to understood that understood me and under, understood kind of what made me tick and under, understood the language as well. So he was a massive support to me in the early days because uh, not only did he understand the language, but he, he really understood the culture very, very well. So those, I'd say, first five, six weeks in terms of getting your message across and stuff like that, it was very hard work, but it wasn't problematic because the players were very open and receptive and they wanted to learn. They wanted to get the most out of their career and, um ultimately once you're doing things on the on the pitch it's less about the words anyway and more about kind of the, the the pictures you're painting um and yeah they grasp they grasp things very quickly on the training pitch but then obviously building the confidence levels for them to play a new style shall we say um building those confidence levels with very little time I only had four weeks uh, before the season started so four weeks to recruit your your five foreigners four weeks to get them fit and and uh, accustomed to a, a new kind of way of playing so it, it took a little bit of time really for what they were doing in training to really click into to games um, but you know the, the language barrier was okay because I got great people um, and I would say the players were just willing, you know, they were willing and very open to learn. In terms of yourself, then, what what did you make of the the standard of Cambodian football? Because I, I was trying to rack my brain, could I think of a Cambodian footballer? And I, I, I couldn't. Again, that's why obviously European bias coming out. So for yourself, then, what do you make of the, the standard of player, the standard of football, the, the league itself, or how professional it was? What, what, what was the whole package like in terms of Cambodian football? Yeah, look, one of the reasons why I stayed was I, I could kind of, there was, I could see kind of Cambodia is a very different country to Ireland, but I, I, I could see parallels to the, the Irish football and story in terms of, you know, I suppose 1988, 1990 in Ireland and, and how the national team success really kind of, 
kicked football into gear in the country, or maybe kicked the country into gear as well in in, in terms of a give it a lift. Um, and I could see that Cambodia, Cambodians love football, and if you could do something here, that it could it could have a serious knock on effect just in society in general. So the 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 talent is in Cambodia. They have the players uh, that they are technically gifted. Um, just you know professional football is quite new in the country they have to learn how to be professionals they have to learn how to change their diet etc uh, do the sports science and the strength and conditioning that's necessary to kind of get get at that top top level so i would say that the first generation of pro footballers are are playing now in cambodia so you probably have to go through another generation or two before it kind of the habits that you need to be top level need to be you know ingrained if you like uh, but uh, I would say that there would be a country to watch over the next ten years, because I I think they'll they'll start to to, to climb the the FIFA rankings. And do the are the majority of the players say are they, are they still in Cambodia or are they off pay playing Australia, New Zealand, China, or or, or is it just majority domestic based amount? So M- Malaysia would have been the place that they went to a lot. Um, so there's been three or four players in Malaysia down through the years, uh, one or two in Thailand. Uh, one player then got a, a, a second tier team in Japan as well. So th- those would be the markets that moved to. Um, but right now, all the Cambodian players are in Cambodia. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is the Cambodian league itself is getting a lot stronger. And um, the let's say the national team players the amount of money they'd get in, in the neighbouring countries is is not massively different. Um, so they prefer to stay where they are really and try and, you know, get into the equivalent of a Europa League and, and do something for one of the clubs in their own country. And it sounds like even maybe that they, it, 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 it's popular on, in, in the country football itself. So if you're driving around the cities, like is it something you'd say lads wearing football jerseys, maybe watching, say, European football and local pubs or local coffee shops is, is that quite common to see in Cambodia as well? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Like to the degree that to the degree that I was quite disappointed last year because they brought in a, a Japanese CEO of the league who who uh, looked to be frank, uh, co- tried to copy and paste what they do in the J League and just do it in Cambodia, which is preposterous, really, to be honest. Um, but one of the things he did was moved a lot of our games to six o'clock on Saturdays, which in Cambodia is a very stupid thing to do because uh, Cambodians work on Saturdays on the main in most in in most scenarios. So you're putting games on on a work day, which uh, you know it's not the best idea when you're trying to grow the game. And then six o'clock in Cambodia is twelve o'clock in England when when you know these twelve o'clock games are basically put on TV for this Southeast Asian and Chinese kind of market, you know, so um, they, they were unnecessarily putting the league up against uh, the English Premier League, which is, you know, the biggest brand when you talk about football, probably in any country in the world. So, um, no, football is very much number one there. But I think similar to the League of Ireland, you, you need you need to pitch the National League in the right way at the right times um, to maximise, you know, the interest and the attendances. In terms of the style of football in Cambodia, I, I, I mean, we think of Irish football, I suppose the first thing Trump said was always people say the physicality or the aggression or whatnot. What's kind of the 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 the, the overarching style of the Cambodian football? Is it technical? Is it like what 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 kind is the favour there? Oh, very technical. Like if if you you're playing in boxes over in Cambodia, they they actually call it monkey. Um, so, you know, um, when they're doing their boxes and that over there, honestly, like you're going to be in the middle for an awful long time because their their technical quality is very, very good. Uh, but what they haven't grown up with maybe is always a tactical understanding, uh, but that can be given to them, obviously. Um, and then, yeah, physically, they, they have to develop as, uh, physically massively. Um, now, I was lucky in my time in Swirin that, the longer I stayed, the more the club invested in in sports, in, in GPS, in analysis, etc. Um, and then the players really bought into that because they could see that you know they were 
they were physically or technically or tactically developing because we were putting tools and resources into to helping them do that basically. Well, and it's, in terms of obviously back home, one of the big conversations you you hear a lot of is about say maybe the professionalism of the game or issues like referees have to improve. What was that like in terms of? Uh, in, in Cambodian football, like is how is the league ran? What's the standard of ref like over there? Um, well, uh, I think the referees would have aged me more than any other circumstance. Um, you know, uh, we won the league in 2019. Uh, we lost the cup final in 2019. Uh, it was a penalty shootout. If you're able to see the footage of the last penalty, the their goalkeeper was about a foot and a half off the line before Arla took the penalty. Um, and yeah, we, we 2020, we lost the, the league on head-to-head. So there was a seven-minute goal in stoppage time in one stadium uh, that won a team, the league, while we were winning our game last day of the season. And uh, yeah, uh, let's just say seven, seven minutes of stoppage time in that particular game was an interesting decision. So... Uh, there's lots of circumstances over the last five or six years, you know, where where uh, I would say I had to show a lot of restraint when it came to the referees. But um, I, I think that's actually where where the game in Asia has to improve the most. And um, I know there's friction sometimes in the League of Ireland with the referees. But, uh, yeah, I, w- I would have shipped the Irish lads out to Cambodia any day and let them referee uh, my games, <laughs> if I'm being honest. In terms of yourself, actually, regards the football, how did you settle from moving from Limerick to living in Cambodia again, different culture or whatnot? How did you find yourself initially moving over that first year or two? Oh, the first five, six weeks, if you like, I'd, I'd, I'd gone from Melbourne to Phnom Penh at that point, and Melbourne's this very cosmopolitan kind of city, you know. Um, and then I went to Phnom Penh and five or six weeks I was like you know where am I like what I'd never been to Saudi East Asia before it was like it's like another planet to be honest um and then what happens over time is you adjust you adjust to the lifestyle and you 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 start realizing that there's massive benefits that for a small amount of money you were probably living in an apartment block that had a swimming pool on the rooftop and you know on your day off you were there it was 35 degrees and you were you know, walking a few yards to a rooftop pool kind of thing. So there, there was, I think sometimes people go to these countries and they go, they, they kind of like, ah, oh, the traffic or the noise or the pollution and all these things. But I'm always been, I've always been someone that adapts to places and it's like no place is better than another place. It's just different. Um, and what I, what I tended to do, you know, when you talk about lifestyle is levitate towards the stuff that was better in that particular country, you know, and, uh, it's good climate, very friendly people, great expat community, um, and yeah, kind of on your day off, you could have a really nice day for not a lot of money, you know. So there, there, there was uh, lots of pros, I would say, to my time in Cambodia, and um, my mother was quite happy because I finally found a, a wife as well, you know. So um, um, I think she she would have sent me to Cambodia maybe fifteen, sixteen years earlier if she thought. It would have made me settle down, you know. Um, so, so yeah, no, I it, look. I really love the country, to be honest. And and leaving to go to to India was was really a footballing decision that I made. But uh, on a personal side, it was a it was a tough decision. The you mentioned the expat community there. I suppose like I've plenty of friends over the years now who emigrated that kind of twenty to thirty bracket. Um, and so Cambodia has been probably one of the destinations that's come up. So like how big is the Irish community over in Cambodia? Well, I tell you, it's remarkable. The, the, the lad who um who translated for me in my first year, Connor Wall, set up a GA club here five, six years ago. And they're actually going to Derry now with uh, a men's team, which is mainly Irish lads, but it's 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 um there's some Cambodians on the team and there's some that's from other countries also, but they're also bringing a women's team and the women's team is completely Cambodian. Uh, so it's a mad story. Like, you know, that, that uh, the Irish community were able to set up a GA club in this, you know, very remote place from a, from an Irish perspective and get the locals involved and, and, and like basically to say a, 
a women's Cambodian Gaelic football team going to Derry. I, I think they might be going the next week or two. Um, so the community is very strong. Um, there isn't a massive amount of Irish, but it's, it's a strong, close community. And we have a lot of people working in, in uh, uh, as teachers over there. Um, and then some working with NGOs and, and, and different lines of work. But um, you do, you know, when you move in these smaller circles, you, you do meet some very interesting people uh, that are living that part of the world. Um, um, and yeah, it was, it was probably one of the best things about Cambodia was just really, really good expat community and, and uh, lo- lots of kind of support there, you know. Yeah. So I was getting back to the football that, you arrive in what 2018, early 2018, and then the, the next season you win the league. I you already mentioned that that's I would imagine that's that's pretty much an instant impact you made going from you know just literally taking over as a rookie manager in the league to a year later win the league. That must be a surreal feeling. Yeah, well, year one on the seventh game, we we had a riot, and I so saw we <laughs> won two. One, two, drew two, lost two. And in the seventh game, there was an incident between a Japanese player and another team and, and one of our players. And for some reason, I, you know, the kit man decided he'd help out and walked on the field. And then the Japanese player turned around, kind of punched the kit man. And just like in Asian culture, you don't disrespect your elders. You don't disrespect people in in a in a position of authority. So this was seen as being a a real no-no, you know, when the Japanese player punched the, the kit man. And basically our bench emptied, our players, uh, uh, fans uh, left left the stand. It was just literally a like 10-minute little mini-riot, to be honest. And uh, as you can imagine, you know, you I was a UFA licensed coach and that module hadn't come up at any stage in any of my coach education, you know, dealing with a riot mid-game. Um, and so far in the pro license, interestingly enough, it hasn't come up also. Um, so yeah, it was, it was like, how do you deal with that basically? And luckily the club really backed me because it seemed there, there had been some incidents like that in the past. And, uh, we got half of our team banned for half of the season, basically as a result of that. And, um, I, I got given the responsibility of kind of, uh, fixing that if you like, and, the last three games of the first season, everyone was back from suspension. We won the last three games and then we went 30 more games without losing. And, and that brought us to the last day of the season where we were undefeated in the league and we were in the cup final. And uh, we'd won the league already at that stage. But unfortunately, we lost the last day of the season uh, uh, to lose the invincible tag. And uh, we lost on penalties in the cup final. So, yeah, the, the, the league... The league was great to win it. It was a great kind of vindication for those that backed me in year one. Um, uh, but, you know, we, we also, we had lots of horrors. Like we, we lost two cup finals on, on penalties and we went to the last day of the season in the league on four occasions um, and, and came out the wrong side uh, on three of them. Uh, so, um, uh, but look, I, I loved my time over there. The team were very consistent, uh, very professional they showed me a lot of respect as the head coach and, and uh, you know, we, we played against 12 international opponents and won 10 times. We played in the equivalent of the Europa League, the AFC Cup, and would have beaten Bally United, who are a team with a budget about seven times our size. So there were some nice memories in there for, for all of us, you know, staff, players, supporters, and, and, and the owner as well. You know, people forget about owners, but... In markets like Cambodia, and, and it's quite similar in Ireland, you know, when you have an owner, they're just losing serious money every year. And um, it is nice when you get a bit of success and, and it kind of makes it a bit worthwhile for them. Yeah, you touched on there. Kind of my next question was, the, obviously, if you win a domestic league in Europe, you're automatically put into a European competition. Uh, did you, with how does the structure work with you in the Cambodian League? Are you put into a qualifier for the Asian Champions League? And then if you miss it, you go into, as you said, the kind of the equivalent of the Europa League. How does that work there in Asia? Yeah, so the AFC Champions League in Asia, um, not every nation has a pathway to it. Um, so uh, it's mainly to do with the success of the national team, to be honest. Um, so Cambodian national team was was man- by a Gazuki Honda, the ex AC Milan player who 
doesn't have any coaching qualifications and doesn't think he needs them. And uh, he, he was the head coach in Cambodia for many years. And look, to be honest, the FIFA rankings suffered massively because, um, you know, you, uh, being a player and being a coach is two separate jobs and you need to prepare yourself for it. And to be honest, he didn't. Um, and as a result, kind of the FIFA rankings of of Cambodia is not high enough for the clubs basically to get get into the Champions League. So the clubs suffered really because the national team didn't didn't do their work. Um, but in the equivalent of the Europa League, Cambodian teams would be would they'd have about a fifty percent strike rate in the group stages. You know, win one, lose one kind of thing. Um, um, and they normally come third, to be honest, the Cambodian team in the group of four, and then. Uh, actually the way it's done Asia is so massive you know and I didn't really realize how big it is until I moved out there but what's different in Asia is the Champions League and the AFC Cup is regionalized because you know the amount of traveling you'd have to do is so big if you don't regionalize it so Southeast Asia in the equivalent of the Euro- Europa League the AFC Cup has three groups and you have to top the group and then one best second place team will make it to the semi-final of that zone. And then you have to win your zone basically to make the wider knockout phases, if that makes sense. Um, so unfortunately, COVID coincided with our run in the in the AFC Cup. And um, we we beat a uh, team from Laos twice, um, lost to Ceres Negros, which is a Philippine team with basically a load of um, uh, Filipino uh, players who had grown up in Europe basically um, so it was like a European team so we lost to them then we beat Bali United and then then Covid struck basically and, and the, the tournament didn't get completed unfortunately I hope you got out to Bali did you? Did you get a chance to get to Bali for the terms cancelled? Well the good the good news story was we beat them the bad news story was it was a home match uh, uh-huh. <laughs> so and I was, we were gutted um, because not just to get out to Bali but you know the 25,000 people go to their games in Bali you know it's, it's a decent football club and uh, you know the players they had in their team that time that Marvin Plache who'd spent most of his career in the Eredivisie that Paolo Sergio who'd been playing with Braga for most of his career um, Spasovic is a striker he's been a top scorer in the Croatian League and um they had the defensive midfielder uh, who'd played for Osterons, uh for Graham Potter for for you know he played Europa League for Graham Potter uh, with Osterund. So and they were you know it's the type it's the type of team that you want to kind of set your like you want to see how can we do against a team with those kind of players and you'd like to have done it in a full stadium with twenty five thousand people you know but uh, hopefully we'll you know Swire in that club will will get that opportunity again in the future because. They built a training ground just before I left, and they're 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 building a stadium as well. So they're really really investing in the future, which, which you know is is great that I I had a small part to play in, in kind of, the club itself trying to leave a legacy. You know. Yeah, yeah. On the facilities, how does it compare? I suppose a simple question to ask, Bertie. How does the facilities in Cambodia and football compare to what we see here in Irish football in terms of the top level? Is it? Are they on an equivalent, or is maybe are the camp is the Cambodian league ahead in terms of its you know pitches and st- stadia and training facilities? Where, where where's the kind of uh, the difference or comparison like? Uh, you know, from my knowledge of, of of the league of Ireland, for for the what we have now in the club that I just left, only Rovers would have better than what we have, um, and you know the top three or four clubs in Cambodia. I think would all have uh, on a par with the top teams in Ireland, uh, but where where it is in in countries like Cambodia, this, the disparity between the best and the worst is greater. Um, so, you know, the team with the worst facilities, let's say in 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 the first division in Ireland, probably ha- has better facilities than the worst the worst one in 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 the top tier in Cambodia, if that makes sense. But mm. I think where where the top clubs are. They're in a very similar position to the League of Ireland in terms of budget, uh, in terms of facilities, um, and not in terms of, of le- level of players because what I would say is football is the weakest link sport. Um, so, you know, your weakest player in your 11 
will have a bigger say in the outcome of the result than, than your best player normally. Um, and that's, you know, there's been quite a lot of research done on that. And that's that's kind of proven in general in football. So because of that, you know, the League of Ireland, I would say, is a higher level than Cambodia. But if you're comparing the best players on the pitch to, to one another, it, it's quite comparable. How many Irish players did you come across in the league? I know Clyde O'Connell was one player that came over uh, to play, to play in Cambodia, played with your club. Uh, was there any other Irish players that around the league that you're surprised to see or any Irish maybe players in the, or any, rather or any other Irish people in the background in terms of coaching or maybe physiotherapists or maybe even in clubs and, and themselves? Like, how many Irish people involved yeah. in the league? So I suppose I, I was the first one and then the, the next person to come is a guy called Colm Curtis who's uh, um, he's now a pro licensed coach he was an A licensed coach at that time uh, from Belfast and uh, Colm kind of just landed landed in Cambodia and knocked on my door and said do, you know do you want to give me a job so I gave him a job for a few months and then you know we we were investing in the whole staff at that time and to be honest he was like look I need more money and I said look if, if you want more money, I can't hire the goalkeeping coach that I'm about to hire and the sports scientist that I'm about to hire. So he ended up moving to one of our rival clubs as an assistant coach. The head coach never showed up and he got the head coaching job. And, uh, you know, he, he did a very good job. He won he won the cup in his first season. Um, and unfortunately, even though he was having a great second season, uh, you know, he parted ways with the club. Uh, I think it was a difficult club to deal with the imper- internal politics. Uh, so you call him then, uh, call him brought uh, a head physio called Stephen Corner, who's also from Belfast. Uh, after a year, um, I, I stole Stephen from, from Colum uh, and brought him over uh, to us. Uh, he's really, really brilliant physio, uh, which is very hard to get. Um, so that, that, that was three Irish in the league at that stage. I brought over Paddy Barrett, who was trying to escape COVID uh, in America. Um, and basically, Paddy wanted to know, was he going to be locked down in Cambodia? I said he wasn't. He got here. He was locked down in a hotel for two weeks, being fed food by the government. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't a great start when Paddy came over. And our, our, our training ground at that point got flooded as well. So Paddy came here at a really bad time. And uh, I joke with Stephen O'Donnell, who's on the pro license with me now, saying that, you know, Stevie tapped up Paddy and, and Paddy left. He left us in pre-season. But... Uh, I have a great relationship with Paddy uh, because uh, he's a top, top player and uh, happy to see him continue to do well, you know, in the League of Ireland with, when he was with Pats, with, with, with Stevie and, and, and now that he's moved on to, to Shells. So it didn't work out with Paddy, but it, it was a case of right person, wrong time, I would say. Um, and then, yeah, Clyde, obviously I would have coached Clyde in Limerick. Uh, I, you know, I was along with Tommy Barrett, we would have brought him into the 19s and he's a player that I really rated uh, I think he's got massive potential and, you know, he did very well with us last year in terms of we were very, very close to winning the league again. You know, we were probably a, a kick of a ball away once more. And, uh, you know, you don't normally bring younger foreigners here because adapting to these countries, it's much more helpful if you're very experienced. Um, and, you know, I think it was difficult for Clyde at times because he probably didn't have that experience to to help him kind of adjust. Uh, but there was times in the season where he was absolutely smashing it on the field. And uh, we loaned him out actually to a team in Laos at the end of the first season. And he's won the, won the championship there in Laos uh, this year. So I hope, you know, I hope he gets a kind of a, a big move now this this year and his career kicks on because when you talk about potential, he's he's just got a massive amount of it, you know. Looking ahead then, obviously, moving over to India, working in the Indian Super League, I imagine that's a step up in terms of just everything around the football in terms of maybe the, the facilities, maybe just the standard of football in general, the money involved in that game, I imagine it'd be a bit of a step up from Cambodia. Yeah, I, I think where it's a step up is exposure, like you said, money, facilities, just the size of India as a country. Um, and... The, you know, playing wise, it's a much more physical league. You know, it's a very physical league, actually, the Indian Super League. Um, obviously, you've big named coaches like Owen Kyle is coming back into the league. I haven't won before. You've 
a couple of Spanish Spanish coaches who probably the listeners wouldn't know who they are, but like they're, they're, they're quite famous in Spain. Um, coming back into the league, having won it before. Des Buckingham, who's from Oxford, uh, um, is part of the City Group. Mumbai are part of the City Group. And, you know, he won the league uh, here last year or so. Um, and then you've got players like Jason Cummins, who would have played in the World Cup, who's just been signed to play with one of our rivals, ATK, to, to play as a striker this year. So, yeah, you you, ha- you have kind of names that you can associate, if you like, as a football fan in the league. And uh, as, a, as a football and professional, you know, I'm really excited to be kind of going up against these these people and, and testing myself and, and, and testing ourselves as a club against them. Yeah, and look at the club you're taking over. Like they, they had a decent year last year. They came second. I think they're their former champions of the league as yeah. well. So it's, it's I imagine you're going to a club that that has a high expectations to challenge the top end of the league. I would say yes and no to that to that question. Um they 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 won the playoffs two years ago, having finished second in the league, and they finished second again last year. Uh the outgoing coach did an absolutely remarkable job. Um, but the model of the club here is to bring in young players, develop them, and then because some of the top budget teams spend so much more on salary that you end up losing those players, you know. So we've just sold the the Indian left back to to Mumbai, uh, which as I said is in the city group. Um so the way the club here operate is they probably operate on three year cycles where where there's a bit of a rebuild and and then then you kind of you go for it within that three year cycle. So I think the expectations are there. That's fair, but also kind of the model of the club kind of dictates that there has to be resets at different times. And you know, I I guess I would be part of this reset. Uh, there's eight players uh, have been outgoing in this off season, um, uh, which means basically a dismantling of a successful team and and a rebuilding of. Of one that you know will take a little bit of time to rebuild, but uh, I I think the talent is there in the team going forward to to remain competitive, and uh, and that would be the plan, you know. And when does the league kick off? In? Yeah, so I fly back to India Wednesday morning. Here I, I get in there late late Thurs, Thursday morning uh, in Indian time, and and pre first day of pre season will be a few a uh, few hours after I land back in India. So. Um, really looking forward to it because moving from Cambodia to India, I've had about two, two and a half months without coaching. So, uh, um, uh, you know, when you're when you're addicted to it, it's uh, two and a half months is a long time. So, I'm looking forward to getting back on the pitch again. We can't even great your time. Thanks so much for coming to the podcast and chat again soon. My pleasure, Luke. Thank you. And there's kind of a lot of grumbling about maybe we don't have enough Premier League players, but in terms of the Championship, as a... what's the point in grumbling about it? But the step I, I, I the can't hold them out, can I? If, if they're not playing the Premier, what's the point of me grumbling? But the step up to international football in the Championship is it kind of it's it, it, an easy management. Well, I tell you about when we played in 2002. What's, what's the point of me like grumbling? grumbling? We had lads who were all at the bottom of the Premier League, real scrapping away, Kins and Matty Holland and. Uh, Gary Breen, who hadn't even got a club. What's the point of grumbling? So, I, I don't subscribe to that, you know, you just... Whatever it is, whatever I've got, I'll get them together and make the best of them and try and make sure we qualify. Grumbling is not one of the things I do. You can subscribe to each new episode of the Extra Time.ie Sportscast on iTunes. Please give a rating or add a comment there to let us know your views. Welcome back to the fourth half this week, four parts. And Mike Dara has rejoined me. Before we finish up, will we have a little quick maybe chat about the European games that happened this week? We, if anyone's listening and didn't listen to last week's podcast, please refer to last week's podcast with Sean Groves where we did cover because we weren't 100% sure when we we'd get this out on Monday or Tuesday. So this will be out Tuesday at some stage. But just, if you want to listen to Sean Groves, please click back at the end. It is in the rollers. Mike Dara gave a preview for that game. And I also, also did a, oh, sorry, I also did a who are um Rovers opposition online as well, where I went into Pride of Blick just to go and go through there. They're not a, a multi-club uh um team, but they're a multi-sports team. So yeah, they including a, a chess club as part of their club as well. And they're the biggest they claim to be the biggest sports club in Iceland. So yeah, and I'm traveling now to be covering that game for 
for extra time the away leg uh, next week yeah and I'll be covering the home leg so I suppose it's it's there it's similar to what you see maybe in Central Europe I'll say Bayern Munich Bayern Munich will have like a lot of different facets to the organisation with like say different sports some sort of yeah like. yeah so taekwondo um, basketball uh, track and field even track and field oh. yeah Right. Pats then let's chat about the other team from the south side I I think it's the toughest tie possibly out of the, the far yeah uh, I, 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 I do, do launch are a decent team yeah they are now they, they, they've had you know various you know good seasons in Europe and then well I was going to say bad season in Europe been knocked out by Bowes in the Viva Stadium but that's probably a little bit as disrespectful to Bowes but Bowes won but Bowes won but Bowes won that game Bowes won that game well and it was it was one of those games in the Viva where it was kind of just as we were kind of coming out of COVID and I think any Bohemians fan that was there it's probably a game that they they look back on really fondly because say we're just coming out of social distancing and whatnot and it was going to limited capacity I think it was I think it was maybe nine or ten thousand that was allowed or something like that. And uh I think Georgie Kelly got a couple of goals that night and it was a it was a very impressive win. But they have got Dudelange, I've got pedigree, like um they like they finished third in their league last year. They were ten points behind the the champions. Um and they're out of season. So like that's really helpful to the League of Ireland sides and um y- uh, so I, th- I think that'll really help Pats. But yeah, I think if you look at, you know, Dundalk of a team from Gibraltar, Derry of Torshavn, like, you know, I think again, I'm not I'm not watching them week in, week out, so I don't, and I'm not covering the game, so I haven't done my homework on them. But looking at the at the Pats do lunch game, yeah, I think it probably is one of the most difficult ones um, of of the size. I think Brady Blick are. While they're the champions, they're well off the pace in in Iceland. Um, whereas St. Pat's will be hoping to to catch the Luxembourg side cold because they're only coming back from their preseason. Yeah, and it's I think it's worth mentioning as well, like like that buzz result, like we we were saying, like that that was a very impressive result because the year before Dulange were in the Europa League. Yeah, and they group did, stages, well. yeah. Yeah, and, and they played and their group was difficult. I just had in front of me here, Sevilla, Apoel, and Carabag. And like they're all very, very decent sides. I mean, you know, so if you have their, they're kind of the bastions of the Europa League. They win it every second year. But like even last year, again, like you know, different difficult sides. They got, not, they got knocked out by Malmo, like Poznan. Like they're decent European sides. So it's going to be a tough game. Of Pats, Pats. I think if you uh, maybe three months ago, I'd be maybe a bit more apprehensive. I am. I probably am more confident going to the game. I mean, we've only lost two games, not 12, eight wins, three draws. We, we're, we're in a good space with John. Yeah. Daly and I, and, I, and I, I am confident going into the games. I think that there's definitely a chance that we can progress through this round. And then again, of course, come to the look of the draw. Um, I, I think, and my own point of view, I think the big change for me that's helped that pass in the last few months was say, I think putting Connor Carthy as the vocal point in the side has really helped. I think he just, I understand the temptation is to put someone like Gondoyle Doyle in experience and, you know, when he's in the box, he do fancy him to score, but he is 35, we have to remember as well. And I think Conor Carty, well, he maybe he's not as prolific in front of goal, maybe to own Doyle is. I think he gives legs and I think that's really important, especially away from home, that you have that out ball up front and that's what they're going to hope Carty Moraney offer. Yeah, uh, but having someone like Doyle to be able to come off the bench, um, mm. like not the experience of playing you know, his career in the UK rather than than European nights, although he has experience playing Europe. But I think, as you said it there, Pats are in um, a good run of form at the minute. Uh, I think what is a draw is the only defeat they've they've had anywhere anywhere recently. And I think carrying that momentum in, like they really should have won the other night, uh, let a very late goal in against uh, against Cork, and then they thumped UCD the previous week. So. Um, uh, and John Daly's getting the the most out of the squad that he that he had. So yeah, I, I'd be reasonably confident that um, they'd be going through. But I think maybe we mentioned last week. Although I think I said all the teams are playing at home first leg, but they're not. But I, I'm, you know, there is a chance that all four Irish sides can can go through. Uh, and I think this is probably the one, the, the maybe the more the more difficult one. But I'd be confident that Pats will go through to the next round. Where 
they'll play Glen, the winners of the Glen Torrent tie, tie, isn't it? Yes. So the, the hope would be that the game would be down only 100 kilometers of the road, which would be, again be a nice thing for like fans. That, and yeah, and it would be, um, you know, would it be a win? It'd be a winnable tie, but just from a logistics point of view for the for the club and also for fans, um, uh, it'd be it'd be brilliant. Like you're taking a half day off work rather than taking three days off work to to fly to fly to Luxembourg or to fly to Belgium. The Netherlands, Germany, France to to get into Luxembourg for for that game as well. Um, so th- like that's you know that gives them the opportunity. You need to win the matches, but you know the the roof would open up to get into the the third qualifying round uh, potentially. And um, but who are Glen Torrent playing? I just can't remember. Oh, that's a good question, and I will Google it as we're talking. In when's where, the last time four Irish sides qualified? Because now last year didn't happen, we, we got three, wasn't it? Derry got knocked yeah, out. Yeah, I think two. you have to, you're going back, uh, you're going back before Shamrock Rovers were getting back into Europe because that's that's how I'd know. So, you, you, you know, you're going back before 2009, I think, you maybe 2006, I think, it was all four teams went through. Um, but you're talking about that length of time, like you, you're you're certainly going, it's, it's before 2009 anyway. I had a look here as we were walking from there. It's good. It, oh, okay, me, me and my foreign pronunciations. I'm going to have a hazard of guess. I'm going to say Giza from Malta. That's probably horrendous. Yeah, someone from Malta. Okay, yeah. So, and, well, there we go. So, Malta. I so, so, I would have seen Hibernians in Malta last year and they were pretty rubbish. Uh, Shamrock Rovers won the first leg 3 0 at home and, mm. and drew nil all away, just strangled the game away. So, if they're playing a team, uh, I don't know whether they did Hibernians win the, the league this year, but then. That's potentially a winnable tie for for Glen Torn anyway. And speaking of kind of cross border games, the Avenir Cup finals also won this week actually. Cliftonville and Galway are in the final this Saturday. Yeah, if people haven't seen the video of Galway uh, United put up, it's uh, an expletive ridden video of them celebrating uh, just to the team huddle after the penalty shootout win uh, on Saturday. And uh, yeah, it's it's really entertaining. You can just see what it. You just see what it meant for the for the coach and for the for the players, but yeah, that's uh, that's the the final of the setup. That is, uh, yeah, from from one football association playing the the other football association, which is probably what they would have wanted. I'm not suggesting anything went uh, untoward, mm-hmm. but it is probably good for the competition that there is a team from 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 both sides. Yeah, again, I think the more football we won't be that debate now it's 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 we'll be here all day but I think it's good to have these cross border games as well. I mean I I can see how long ago was the Cup that was when we were growing up those are they were great games and you probably went to some of the games with Linfield and Chalk Road. Uh, I went I would have gone to a few games with with uh but yeah I went to a few Shelburne games uh went to um yeah would have been would have been in Windsor Park as well uh distillery uh cup uh What's I was yeah I went to went to a few of them yeah well, yeah it was good but I can yeah I can un- I can understand why they're not been played in the men's game if I can put it like that. <laughs> right. we will go through the fixtures before we wrap up for this week. Obviously, the European games for Pat's Dundalk, Derry, and Rovers week, but there is some domestic action too. Starting with the Premier Division, we have UCD Drogs, Shells, Bowls, Cork City against Sligo Rovers. That's on Saturday at quarter to eight. And the first division, we have Treaty United, Waterford, Bray, Wexford, Athlone Town, Galway, Finhouse Cove, and Longford Town against Kerry. That is on Saturday, half seven. Right there, you are going to a Dublin Derby week? Yeah, I'm going to go to the Shelburne Bowes game, the uh, the warm up game for the, the cup game because they've drawn each other in the cup as well the, the following week. Yeah, what do you make that actually the cup games on after, uh, after European games? Are you surprised or? Uh, well, they just have to fix them in whenever. Yeah. So, no, I, I, like. Uh, all all four teams are are in Europe are playing on the Sunday. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's a few uh, maybe annoyed over that, but I mean, over what well, like I, the day they're playing played on, like yeah, the Sunday you have to, you have to play these games at some stage. Somehow. So um, and you can't keep cancelling games like you think the European sides have, um, you know, there there were two games moved forward and had to play them, but we spoke about this last week. Yeah, I think we'll leave it there. That's me signing off now for the next three weeks. Don Ryan will be taking over hosts and duties while I'm away for the next couple of weeks. But don't worry, the show will be as good as ever. McDarrett, thank you. Thank you, Luke. All the best on your travels in the World Cup.
I'll enjoy it. Thanks to Connor Nestor and thanks to Lucas Browning. And we'll chat to you all next week.